Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for giving up your Saturday night to be here. Sciencey events, I love to see that. My name is Jabida Ali. Um, I'll tell you, first of all, what we're going to do th this evening, and that introduce our panellists. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Summer Science Exhibition, and each of our panellists has got um, a, a five to ten minute presentation, which we're all going to try and keep to seven, aren't we? Um, and then we're going to have a little discussion. We've got some questions, and we'll have a little discussion amongst ourselves. I'll try and keep that to about 20, 25 minutes, if, if possible, so that we've got at least half an hour for an audience discussion so that you can ask questions to the panellists on the science of attraction. So um, I've been asked, first of all, to um, promote the science exhibition. Hopefully you all know about it. I hope that most of you have been on the website and found out about this event. So the annual Summer Science Exhibition showcases the most exciting cutting-edge science and technology research. It provides a unique opportunity for members of the public to interact with scientists and ask them questions about their work. Scientists, scientists, real scientists. Um, and the exhibition is the Society's main public event of the year. Don't forget, there's, there's also events all the way through the year. Um, but over the summer, there's this kind of big series that they have um, open to members of the general public as well as students and teachers, scientists, policymakers and the media. Um, and I think we're about halfway through the event, so there's lots of other events coming up, so please do look into those. Um, so, um, today, tonight's panel, I've been given the synopsis, but we don't, we don't all agree on that, because I've got this one sentence in there which we're a bit confused by. So, what we're supposed to be discussing today is what do women want, what do men want? The question of what we find attractive has been asked worldwide for centuries, which is true. And this is the contentious bit. The importance of being attractive to the opposite sex has increased dramatically in recent times. Really? <laughs> People didn't use, it didn't used to be important? I mean, I'm not sure where that came from, but maybe we can discuss that. Um, but the main point of this event is bringing together es experts in the field um, to discuss theories on attraction through evolution, psychology, um, media, and the commercial world of online dating. Okay, so... Let's get started. I mean, I'm supposed to talk a bit about myself, but actually my background is not science. Um, uh, I mean, I run a couple of businesses. I've got nothing to do with any of this. I'm not a scientist. But one of the things that I happened to somehow do last year when I was feeling really lonely and wanted a boyfriend was I started a meetup group um, called London Science and Geek Chic Socials, which is a singles group for, um, for geeky, sciencey people to, to meet each other. Um, so that's why they've asked me to chair this panel. So uh, sorry if I have a lack of knowledge about the science of attraction, but that's why we have our experts. Um, so first of all, we've got Dr. Anna Machen, an evolutionary anthropologist in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. And her particular interest is in the neurosciences of human relationships. Um, what I'd like to do is um, introduce each person as you go up, just so the audience will remember um, your names and expertise. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, All right, Dr. Machin, thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, as Jabida said, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist in the University of Oxford, and what I'm interested in is really how evolution has shaped the psychology and the neurochemistry of our relationships. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my research very quickly in seven minutes, hopefully, um, tonight. Okay, so let's get back to the beginning, a little bit of biology. Okay, so mammalian biology. We're different to birds and reptiles because we have internal gestation and lactation. So unlike in birds and reptiles, we don't sit on eggs and we don't have to go off and forage for food to feed our infants. As a result of this, male mammals actually have very little to contribute to the role of child rearing, except in a few very special cases. I can hear some tittering already starting there. Um, <laughs> Therefore, female mammals actually need to prioritise child rearing, while male mammals prioritise mating. And because of this, it is the female mammal who is the choosier of the two. In fact, in many species of mammals, the male's pretty unchoosy, to be honest. The fact that he can mate multiple times a day means he's really not bothered. It's more about quantity rather than quality. Okay. However, humans are slightly different, okay? And the reason why we're different is for two reasons. First of all, our brains are much bigger than they should be for our body size. And secondly, we stand on two legs. And those two things combined together make childbirth a little bit tricky. As a result of this, our infants are born very, very dependent. 
Okay, and we have a much shorter gestation for our body and brain size than we should be. And that's simply because if it went full gestation, it would never come out, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay, so we have very short gestation. The other interesting thing about humans is our lactation period, the period of, of producing breast milk, is much shorter than it should be. Okay, and therefore our interbirth interval is very short. However, this has a knock on consequence. Okay. And that consequence is that quite often a human female biologically will have an infant at the breast and also maybe one or two toddlers wandering around at the same time. And those one or two toddlers often are not fully weaned. And therefore, the female needs a hand raising those infants. Now, over evolutionary time, that started off by being her fellow females, because to be perfectly honest, females tend to turn to females first of all. However, it got to the point where the men needed to come on board as well, because our brains got so big that we needed a, a little bit of fatherhood help. And therefore, men started investing in their offspring. This was about 500,000 years ago, for those of you who like a nice timeline. And this meant that males started to become choosy. Because if they were going to take themselves out of the mating game for a greater or lesser period of time, they wanted to make sure that the person they were investing in was going to produce those kids, all right? So here's our first sex differences. Men look for signs of youth and fecundity or fertility, all right? They like their mates to look like they're young, hence they quite like blonde hair and blue eyes, a bit of a generalisation, but there we go, all right? And they like a bit of a curve, a nice waist-hit ratio. The ideal waist hit ratio, by the way, is 0.7, and there's a direct link between that particular number and both your fertility and your health, ladies. Um, in terms of women, we want that guy to stick around and help us with these incredibly dependent children. Okay, so we want evidence that he can provide and evidence that he is loyal. Okay. So, human relationships go beyond just the mating stage. So, what encourages us to stick around? Why don't we leg it, or particularly why don't the men leg it? Um, this is a study we've just started doing, so this is a very noddy bar chart, I'm afraid, because we only got the data in the other day. But we asked 500 couples, basically, about their relationship. We asked them what was important to them in maintaining their relationship. And what we found was, again, was quite a big uh, sex difference. Women very much see their relationship as a bit of a team sport, okay? Everything's about sharing and being equal. So you've shared values and goals and equality in support and investment. If they're going to invest in that relationship, by God, that man's going to invest too, okay? Men, a bit different. First of all, intimacy, very important. Secondly, activities. Men like to share activities with their partner. Okay, I'll show you a slide in a minute. It shows women tend not to like this. Um, and also, bizarrely, men seem to like present exchange. But uh, my husband pointed out to me that's probably not that they wanted presents. It's probably they were just terrified that if they didn't give their partner presents, all hell would break loose. So that's probably what present exchange is about. Also, if we look at long-term relationships, particularly on relationships that happen over a distance, what we also found was quite a striking sex difference. Um, if men... Uh, and women do activities together, men tend to get closer to their partner, whereas women actually get less close to their partner. So that's not particularly good, is it? Anyway, there we are. Secondly, secondly, for women, what's important, though, is actually increased contact, so actually spending time with your partner, talking to your partner. So again, if women spend time in contact with their partner, chatting, doing that sort of thing together, they get emotionally closer to their partner. Fortunately for men, they don't. They actually get less close to their partner. So there's a little bit of, bit of a sex war going on there in terms of what's important. So that's your psychology. But what's really underpinning all this? What's actually causing us, motivating us to stick around? Well, we've seen there's a sex difference in initial attraction, what we find important, but also in how we want to maintain our relationship. But what joins us together, guys, is that sex, uh, both sexes are addicted to love. Isn't that lovely? And this is based upon a theory known as the brain opioid theory of social attachment. And this is what we're currently studying at Oxford using lots of brain scanners. And what this involves is the human endorphin system. I'm sure you've probably all heard of endorphins, you know, runners high, all that kind of thing. They make you feel euphoric and happy and marvellous about life. And they're also quite important in your internal pain system. So if you hurt yourself, you get a lovely flood of endorphins to try and make you feel better. But the thing about endorphins is they're an opiate, like morphine or heroin. They're addictive. Okay. And therefore, what we argue is that we become addicted to contact with our partner. 
when we're in contact with our partner, talking to them or particularly touching them, we get a lovely thread of endorphins and we feel euphoric and it's marvellous, okay? But when we leave our partner, we get withdrawal. So then we go back to our partner to get another hit and that is what is underpinning relationships. Okay. Now, unfortunately, the, the downside of this is that when you split up with somebody, you go cold turkey. Okay, that's why splitting up is so physically and mentally painful, because you are basically withdrawing from an opiate. Now, there's some poor, poor people out there who have a particular gene, which is called a gain-of-function gene. The A118G gene is responsible for the number of endorphin receptors you have in your brain. Okay, and people who have this particular gene have lots of endorphin receptors. So in one sense, it's great. If they get an endorphin rush, whoa, do they get an endorphin rush? All right, sport's great for them. Falling in love is the most marvellous thing in the whole world. But when they split up, they really, really feel it. Okay. So what we're trying to look at, coming back to our sex differences, is whether men and women experience this endorphin rush and this endorphin withdrawal in the same way. Now, I'm afraid we, we can't, I can't give you the answer to that at the moment because we're only halfway through our project of scanning people. But the fact that men and women actually experience pain differently and also the effect of pain killing drugs is different on men and women suggests to us that we will also find a sex difference in the way men and women experience the addiction of love. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. I've got so much to ask you later about, you know, men contributing less and things like that. Um, secondly, all the way from Scotland, we've got Dr. Anthony Little, um, who's a Royal Society University Research Fellow in the Department of Psychology at the University of Stirling. His research revolves around evolutionary approaches to face perception, the extent of agreement on the attractiveness of different face traits within individuals of the same culture, different human cultures, and even between humans and other species. So please welcome Dr. Little. Uh, hello everyone. So uh, I study primarily faces, uh, but I'm interested in lots of different traits. And what I'm going to highlight is just a few of the traits that uh, have interested scientists who are trying to work out exactly what we prefer and why we prefer it. Uh, so I'll start with faces because it's my main interest. Uh, although actually I think all humans are particularly interested in faces. So certain faces <coughs> are more or less attractive than others. Uh, people have done measurements and shown pictures and had them rated for attractiveness for many years. Uh, so people have taken these measurements and looked at the configuration and the size and shape of particular features. Uh, researchers have also been very interested in bodies. So your height, your weight, your, your curvature of your body. Uh, these all affect how attractive people are found. Uh, more recently, people have become interested in movement, uh, so how you move your face, how you move your body, and even kind of how uh, your dancing abilities might show off uh, the fluidity of your movements uh, on even your personality. Alongside physical traits, uh, certain things like the, the pitch of your voice, or how deep or how high it is, uh, the smell of your body. Again, you know, I think as humans, we tend not to think much of, of smell, but the kind of billion pound uh, perfume and aftershave industry tells us something different. People are very interested in how they smell and how their partners might smell. Uh, and of course, I, I have to mention personality, uh, because actually personality uh, usually comes at the top of most people's lists of uh, what they want in a partner. Uh, and these are the sorts of things people like, funny, intelligent, sociable. We aren't actually alone in preferring uh, a lot of these traits, uh, so a lot of my work comes in comparing uh, what non-human animals do with what humans do. Uh, so this is a mandrel with a very exciting facial display. Uh, talking about kind of body traits, well, the, the peacock's train usually gets shown in all talks uh, along these lines because it's a wonderful example of uh, the kind of displaying male and the choosy female. Uh, the peacock, massive, exciting tail, the peahen, She's kind of brown and dowdy. Uh, that's a, a bird of paradise uh, who does this amazing uh, dancing display. So he's using his movements uh, to impress and attract the partner, uh, potentially like humans do in nightclubs. <laughs> Sound is very important. Uh, I've got a picture of a frog. Uh, 
And frogs make mating calls to attract mates to them. Uh, songbirds are particularly famous for their beautiful sound, and they're not wasting that, that sound to make our lives uh, more pleasant. Uh, it's there to, to either defend territory or to attract mates. Uh, pheromone, <coughs> smell and pheromone communication is very important in non-human animals. Uh, pigs actually make a very interesting example because it sort of inspired the kind of human pheromonal kind of salesmanship. Uh, so in, in pigs, you can buy something called hog mate or boar mate, uh, and you spray it, and the pigs will go wild. Uh, it doesn't, well, there's no real evidence for that in humans, so don't rush out and buy, and buy pheromones ba based on that. Uh, but people have, have, have proposed that humans do have pheromones, and that pheromones may play a role in human attraction. Personality in non-human animals is a difficult issue, uh, and an interesting issue. I haven't got a picture of personality. Uh, what I've got a picture of is a bowerbird's nest. And so in bowerbirds, the male decorates this, this nest. So the, the male bowerbird himself, he's not like a peacock. He's, again, like he's a drab, brown bird. Uh, but he de decorates his nest. And actually, I think that's quite a, a beautiful appearing thing. Uh, the female bowerbirds, she jumps around from nest to nest. And she picks the male with the one she finds most interesting, exciting, or artistically pleasing. So at least in some non-human animals, there is some evidence that good taste uh, is enough to uh, attract a partner. Uh, I'm going to give you one example of a particular trait which actually seems to be attractive across a variety of different species. Uh, so this is a, a strange mix of different, different species at the top. They are scorpion flies, sticklebacks, barn swallows, and macaque monkeys. And what they all have in common is <coughs> in scientific studies, all of these species show preferences for symmetry. Uh, so symmetry is found attractive in all of these species. And in part, symmetry is supposed to be attractive because symmetry itself is supposed to be an indicator of quality. So an animal choosing a mate that is symmetrical is gaining some sort of benefit to itself. In humans, there's been lots of research on symmetry all around the world. Uh, so in the US, uh, the UK, America, Europe, Australia, Japan, and Africa, uh, symmetric faces have been found attractive. Uh, sometimes it's done like this. These are computer manipulations of symmetry. On the left, you have the original face. On the right, you have the perfectly symmetric version. It's very subtle, uh, but in, in most cases, people will choose the symmetric one as the more attractive one out of the pair. So that's one trait that I think people might agree on. So symmetry seems to be agreed upon as attractive. Evolutionary views aren't always uh, against the notion that we might like something different. Uh, so actually a phenomenon in, in non-human animals uh, is something called assortative mating. And assortative mating just means that you're pairing up with something similar at rates greater than chance. Uh, so this has been proposed in humans that we like something a little similar to ourselves. <coughs> On the left uh, is a picture of Narcissus from Greek legend. Uh, if you know the story, then he's a handsome man who, wandering around one day, comes across a, a reflecting pool. He sees his, his beautiful face in that pool, and he falls in love with himself. And he can't pull himself away from the pool, and eventually he, he, he starves to death looking at his own beautiful face. Uh, that's too far. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, because you've all come out tonight, you've not, you've not, you're not, not, not self-loving to that extent. Uh, but the picture on the right is, is more what, what I think of illustrates a sort of mating in humans. Uh, so if you imagine these are a real couple, what they've done is they've paired up with someone who's similar in height and weight and facial structure uh, and even demeanor. So in fact, they, they're both uh, fairly miserable as well. So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that doesn't bode that they've, they've chosen correctly. Uh, but actually, in, in, in many, many studies, this is what people have found, that humans are sought for various traits, uh, particularly things like personality, but also for, for height and weight. Uh, and there is evidence that you can match married partners' uh, faces at rates greater than chance. There is, of course, uh, also room for cross-cultural differences in a biological view of attraction. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you might think that if you go all around the world, uh, people's tastes differ. Uh, some people have been studying this scientifically, so this is from a recent study looking at preferences for masculinity in male faces. Uh, and what they found was, as the health of a nation decreased, preferences for masculinity go up. Uh, so 
as your country gets healthier, you stop preferring masculinity so much. And this might be true because uh, if masculinity indicates health, then in countries where health is poorer, health becomes more important and is a stronger criterion for mate choice. So there may be systematic cross-cultural differences uh, based on your kind of current environment. At the bottom, I, I've, I've just put examples of some traits that perhaps are more difficult to explain uh, in terms of biology. So they, they are neck, neck rings, uh, scarification, lip plates, and tattoos. Uh, and these might actually just be uh, arbitrary, culturally preferred traits. Humans are very cultural animals, and you know, we, we learn a lot about what is and isn't, isn't attractive uh, from looking around in our environment. Or, of course, there could be some things that, that we don't see in these pictures that uh, are indicators within particular cultures. For example, the neck rings do seem to have some association with status in that particular culture. And things like uh, scarification and uh, tattooing can be associated with uh, uh, status in particular societies. And the last thing I'm going to talk, show you briefly is uh, just that our experience, recent experience even, can change what you, pref what you prefer. So you can decide for yourself which of these two pictures you would like to hang on your wall. So if someone was giving you these two and you only had to choose one, which one do you prefer? So you can decide for yourself which one you like more. Uh, and it, it may be no surprise that this is a question of familiarity. One of these is the original and one of them is the mirror flip. I'm hoping pe people were leaning towards the original. Uh, and again, in, in scientific studies, this is what people have generally found, that when it comes to art, when it comes to music, and even when it comes to people, uh, you like something that's familiar. The more you're exposed to something, the more you grow to like it. You see lots of people with, with big noses. Big noses become more attractive to you. Uh, and so that's one kind of proximate uh, explanation for, for variation and attractiveness. So you can have things like symmetry, which are attractive across... Uh, individuals, you can have cross-cultural differences, uh, and you can also have uh, experiential differences influencing what you do and don't find attractive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the ideas for Geek Chic events. We're going to go clubbing now, guys. Taking your clubbing and building nests. Um, next we have Joe. Joe Hemmings is a behavioural psychologist on Big Brother and dating relationship coach on BBC One's The Undercover Princes and ITV's London Tonight special, The Love Industry, and regularly appears on Daybreak and This Morning. Please welcome Joe. Thank you. Um, Firstly, I must say I'm the least scientific of this panel. Uh, a shame, by the fact, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. In fact, I don't even know how to use PowerPoint, so I'm afraid you're just going to have to put up with me just for a few minutes. Um, yes, I'm a behavioural psychologist. I'm also a media psychologist, makes me the lowest of the low in terms of psychology, because I'm out there, I think, trying to sort of bring it to the people, but I think sometimes psychologists think I'm sort of dumbing it down slightly. Um, I specialise in dating and relationships, and so very much the sort of power of attraction. Uh, I was the UK's first dating coach um, back 12 years ago now. Um, I was asked to... I was actually asked by a national newspaper to go on um, six internet dates on the base. It was very new. It was in its infancy, internet dating then, and everybody thought it was full of axe murderers and you were taking your life in your hands. And what was this peculiar thing that people were doing trying to find a partner um, on the internet? But I went on these dates. It was reported. Um, they were fine. It was very small then. I mean, a couple of guys uh, had taken JPEGs from um, catalogues and put themselves up. <laughs> there was next catalogue man, and there was also a man who I thought looked remarkably like Piers Brosnan in his photo. Um, it was, in fact, a photo of Piers Brosnan, <laughs> and this guy looked nothing like him. Um, so that's where we were with things like internet dating. I mean, people sort of struggled to start to do it, and... It was assumed to be a slight web of lies. Why would you know? Unlike meeting people in person, you know, you could say anything about your age, you could put any photo up, you could say anything you liked about yourself. It's very one-dimensional. Um, so dating coaches was born because people needed to 
understand more about not only meeting people face to face, but also that new world of internet dating. Uh, and it's, it's got huge. People you know, need that help. Why do they need that help with dating? I think the world has become a much bigger place. Uh, years ago, we, the power of attraction, the need for that, was, was limited, it was self-limiting. We met the guy who lived in our road or was a neighbor or was a friend of a friend or whatever it was, it was very small. And as the world has grown, our expectations of the kind of partner we want to meet have grown. Um, interestingly, when I started the website Dating Coaches, uh, I didn't bother buying datingcoach.co.uk because there were two of us. So it cost me seven quid back in whenever it was, 2000. I was recently offered datingcoach.co.uk for £50,000. I wish I'd put it in my basket at the time when I bought Dating Coaches, but I didn't. So um, I deal with singles and I deal with couples. And the four elements that I, I call the four C's are the really key things in, um, in sort of meeting a partner and staying with a partner. And the first two uh, are chemistry and compatibility. I'm sure there'll be questions. We'll talk about chemistry later. Compatibility, um, pretty fundamental. You've got the same values in life. Um, you don't want to be mirror images of each other, but you do want to be complementary in the way, in your goals and your aspirations and the way you think about life. Those are the two fixed things. Um, and then the other Cs are communication, which is absolutely key um, to sustaining attraction. Uh, and compromise, uh, which is a really big deal if you want your relationship to, to go further through because we don't always move uh, together in a relationship at the same time. We don't always agree with each other, which is part of what sustains a, a good relationship is a little bit of independence from both. Um, so that's where I come from, seeing couples, seeing singles. Um, I write about dating. People want to read more and more about attraction, more about how to find a mate, both in a practical sense and also that sort of knowledge of themselves. How do I know what I want? Are my expectations too high? Um, many of my clients are one of two things, very, very long shopping list of um, wants in a partner so long they're almost guaranteed to never find anybody. Um, and the other half are, I don't really know what I want. I mean, it's a bit like going shopping for a, a garment, you know, a, a skirt. Um, if you go wanting a sort of blue tweed with gold buttons, must be just above the knee with a side zip, probably not going to find it. But if you go out just looking for a skirt, um, <laughs> There are so many out there, you don't know what to choose. So in a way, that's the sort of thing um, I have to deal with. And of course, having written uh, about relationships and dating for so long, I've now moved on to sex, because that's where it goes. Uh, so you'll find me lurking, uh, writing my third sex book now, and um, as a sex therapist on this morning, which was not where I intended my... Um, my area of expertise to go, but there you go, that's what's happened. So I welcome your questions afterwards and thank you. Great, so we've got the Geek Sheet coach now, your resident coach, <laughs> sorry. Um, and finally, we have Sujata Kundu, or Suze as she's known, who's a behavioral psych. Oh, I'm reading yours, aren't yeah. I? Um, Suze is an inorganic materials chemist, so we come to the chemistry finally, at University College London with an interest in all aspects of the chem chemistry of everyday life. Please welcome Suze. I'm going to stand on the side so you can actually see me. Um, right, good evening everyone. My name is Suze. Uh, I am an inorganic materials chemist. I'm also a science communicator, so although this isn't my area, I thought I would try and use my science ability to uh, try and stop me being single as well. Uh, so, a little bit about chemistry. Everybody talks about chemistry, falling in love. Is it really anything to do with chemistry? Well, it is, but chemistry doesn't necessarily do you many favours. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the chemistry that's going on in your bodies when you fall in love. So, falling in love, it kind of falls into three categories. So, the first category of falling in love is lust. So the chemicals involved when you fall in lust with someone, that initial spark, the initial attraction that makes you go, oh, quite like him or her, is because of these two. These are the sex hormones, very much does what it says on the tin, I believe. Um, interestingly, testosterone and estrogen, ladies do produce a certain amount of testosterone as well when you fall into that lusty phase of, of being in love with somebody. 
Um, as testosterone levels fall, you start to go into the attraction stage. Now, in a woman, those levels of testosterone drop before they do in a man, about four months into a relationship compared to about six months for a man. So that can often result in that two-month weirdness of, I would quite like to commit now, but you don't. So there's two months of awkwardness. <laughs> Ladies, I may recommend that, um, I don't know, attract your man two months before you start dating him, perhaps, and then we're maybe <laughs> all on track. I don't know. Um, we are, I, I should probably point out, looking at heterosexual relationships, mostly at the moment. I don't know what happens in homosexual relationships, but happy to look into that as well. Um, the next stage of attraction, then, is attraction itself. Sorry, the stage of falling in love. Um, three chemicals going on here. So the first one is serotonin. Now, serotonin, when you fall in love, your serotonin levels actually drop. Now, this has been associated with a kind of behaviour akin to obsessive-compulsive disorder. So when you fall in love with someone, that crazy, I can't get him or her out of my head feeling is because of serotonin. Now, a certain type of antidepressant, SSRIs, they are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. Your serotonin levels go up. And this is why a lot of times people that are on antidepressants find it very difficult to fall in love because it is a fundamental chemical in this stage of falling in love here. The second chemical, again making it a little bit difficult for you, is dopamine. Now your levels of dopamine go up when you fall in love. The levels of dopamine, when they go up, um, I think tests have been done to show that it, it has the same effect on you, your brain, your body, your personality, as being on cocaine. Um, so again, chemistry isn't doing you many favours here, but though, that is what happens. And so high levels of dopamine give you that loved up feeling. Finally, norepinephrine. It's very similar to adrenaline, which we're always told is the fight or flight hormone. If you're falling in love, punching someone in the face or running away screaming are not ideal responses. <laughs> norepinephrine, it is a lot like adrenaline. Um, it creates that klutzy, clumsy feeling. I mean, certainly if I like somebody, I drop things. I fall over myself. I fall over them. I fall over anything that is in front of me. It's this that, that creates that kind of racing heart, sweaty palm feeling that you get. So at the moment, we're not doing very well with the chemistry. If you do manage to make it through these first five chemicals unscathed and you still have a partner, <laughs> you go on to the third stage, which is attachment. Now, this is where a few of our lovely hormones come in. Now, you do release endorphins at this stage, and we have discussed endorphins a little bit already. Um, and I mentioned the runner's high. I disagree with that. I ran the marathon in April. I use the term run quite loosely here, by the way. Um, no run is high for me, so I think I might be missing the gene or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, the other two chemicals involved are oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, and these are released, uh, should we say, in the peak of physical pleasure, because this is the Royal Society and I want to use nice words tonight. Um, so these two are released, and they, oxytocin is known as the cuddle hormone. They promote these feelings of attachment, of long-term bonding. Oxytocin isn't just released in the peak of physical pleasure. Um, oxytocin is also released, and vasopressin, I believe, uh, after childbirth. And mothers actually express some of it when they express milk, and this is how they form that mother-baby bond as well. So it is very much about promoting long-term bonds with people. Um, now, as I said, I was looking into this to see whether science could help me. Science can help you, but if you're not necessarily in a relationship, you can experience the feelings of being in love. And I do mean in love by this slide, not anything else. Um, everyone talks about chocolate. Ladies love chocolate. Is chocolate really the way to a woman's heart? Interestingly, yes, it can be. It contains a lot of chemicals that can promote the same feelings of being in love. The nice stage, you know, the slightly psychotic, obsessive, compulsive stage, yes, okay. But it's still a nice feeling. Everybody likes that feeling, otherwise we really wouldn't try to keep doing it, would we? So the different chemicals that chocolate has in there, okay, we've got our sugar and our fats, we've got our comfort chemicals there. There's also theobromin, which is very, very similar to caffeine. And what it does is it inhibits, well, competes with adenosine. Adenosine is a chemical that you produce naturally. It promotes sleep. It kind of inhibits any kind of aroused feelings, which is why when you sleep, you're normally, you know, fairly relaxed. 
the abromin competes with this and it allows that feeling of arousal to build up. And that's why they say that theobromine is probably the thing that makes chocolate slightly addictive because you want that feeling of being slightly aroused. Um, tryptophan is another chemical that is found in chocolate. And this is a precursor for serotonin. Again, we did say when you fall in love, serotonin levels drop, but it is quite important to have serotonin in there for that happy feeling nonetheless. Um, the final one is phenylethylamine. And again, it's another one um, released normally when you don't have much on. But you can achieve that if you have no partners, but you do want to feel like you're in love, eat some chocolate. Chocolate really could be the way to a girl's heart. Um, there is a lot about chemistry and love. Uh, this article from Time dates back to February 1993, so people have been looking into how we can create feelings of love. Can we make people fall in love? Do aphrodisiacs work? I personally don't think they do. Um, I mean, aphrodisiacs, things like oysters, a friend of mine, probably shouldn't say this here, a friend of mine said aphrodisiacs only work because anything else you put in your mouth after an aphrodisiac is in comparison a lot better than what you've just consumed. <laughs> so probably shouldn't have said that, but there is, I think, some truth in that. Um, so I'm quite keen on looking into the chemistry of love and it would be really good and interesting to discuss it from, uh, from different points of view. Thank you very much. I've got to say, I've lost my bearings a little bit after that. <laughs> um, okay, let's kick off the discussion. I was quite interested in how you ended with the whole fake in it thing. Because one of the things I was thinking about was, yes, of course, we might be able to fake some of the chemicals. But appearance, makeup, are we trying to become more symmetrical? What, what is all that about? How can we, not that I'm trying to be more attractive to people. I wouldn't be so selfish. I wouldn't ask such a selfish question. But how can we make ourselves more symmetrical? Good question. Uh, so so <laughs> people, people have done research on kind of uh, facial markings. So actually some of that, the, uh, the, what, when I was talking about kind of tribal tattoos, you know, people have kind of drawn lines on faces and some of those lines kind of can show off your symmetry. But they, they don't make your face look more symmetric. If you're symmetric, they just show it off. Uh, with makeup, perhaps you can hide certain aspects of, of symmetry, which are things like blemishes, but your actual structural symmetry, I'm not sure you can, you can kind of fake it. And that's kind of part of the reason why, of evolutionary time, these things become attractive, because they, they're not fakeable. Hmm. What about in, the, um, um, in, in your study? Because we do hear quite a lot of this talk about symmetry. I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced um, in sort of in our urban societies, what do you think of this theory in terms of symmetry? Mm. No, I mean, I think what we've got to remember is we are we are biological animals, so symmetry is still very much um, one of the well one of the prime indicators I think for for finding people attractive. But obviously, it's an unconscious thing. It's not something you're wandering around thinking, oh yes, two arms the same length, that's good. Um, <laughs> but but it is something that we very much and there's been a lot of studies looking at that. And even if we think we're, we're well removed from that, and actually what we're really interested in is whether the guy's got a Ferrari or not. What we do still look at is symmetry because symmetry is so linked to your genetic strength that fundamentally it's incredibly important, particularly you know, if you want to produce healthy offspring, you need to know that the person you're mating with is genetically very healthy, and that's what symmetry is all about. Mm. It's about okay. having healthy, good genes. You, you did mention kind of things like makeup, and I think perhaps not so much kind of struct bone structural traits, but kind of skin traits. You know, those are the sort of things that actually makeup focuses on. So there are studies on makeup use and the sort of things that makeup use changes. So actually they tend to enhance, in women at least, uh, kind of feminine traits, mm -hmm. so they, you know, they, they kind of give the illusion of bigger eyes and bigger lips. And I think it comes in also, makeup obviously comes in with the idea of youth, that's just plastic surgery. So the fact that men supposedly are looking for signs of youth, um, obviously makeup can and plastic surgery can make somebody look younger. Um, and mm -hmm. therefore, you know, obviously that might now in our, in our modern society be skewing evolution slightly because we do now have these techniques where we can supposedly give someone a facelift and they yeah. look younger. Yeah, so that that's, leads me to one of the new things that I learnt today, which is about um, people being attracted to um, men who are masculine or not masculine. So do you think for men in wealthier countries, they should be trying to find ways of becoming more feminine, perhaps? 
yeah, again, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of individual variation in preferences. So again, uh, the women in the audience will probably will know this better than I do, <laughs> and yourselves included. Uh, you know, some, some women kind of like muscular men, uh, whereas you know, for some women, the geek chic clientele probably are, are less interested in, in muscles, perhaps, and sport. Uh, but yes, no, there's, 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 there is a lot of variation, and it is something that people can change. Again, you're probably not going to change your kind of bone structure, but in terms of your kind of masculinity of body shape, you probably can, can change that with kind of working out if you plan. Um, so just moving on a little bit to the media, um, not, I'm saying, not that I'm saying the media's got anything to do with what's happened to sort of attraction um, and appearance. Um, why do you think, um, I know you guys have got your theories, but I would like to hear Joe's opinion. Why do you think evolutionarily we go for a certain thing, you know, somebody who's looking healthy, who's fecundity was the word you yeah. used, um, and uh, someone who can provide. So why are we going for what would seem to be an unnatural perception of beautiful, such as someone who's very skinny and very pale? How has that happened, and well, when did that happen? I mean, as you say, it's media-driven. I and mean, when did it happen? It probably um, happened well over a century ago. That started to happen when we saw images of some sort um, of other people, the images of, of uh, beauty that we could see on a sort of regular basis. Uh, of course, along came, you know, moving pictures, along came television, along came um, advertisements, along came a whole celebrity culture. So what happens is the sort of evolutionary side of, you know, hip-waist ratio, you know, flush cheeks, all the kind of things that attract us to people because we know um, subconsciously, psychologically, this is a good thing. Um, are sort of, they're evolved along with um, what we consider to be, or what the media purports to be the ideal sort of person. So suddenly, uh, we went from the sort of Rubenesque um, curves, probably back in, it really hit home in the 60s. You've got history in there as well. You've got the war, you've got post-war, you've got shapes changing to do with how much food we had, the kind of clothes we wore. In the 60s, suddenly thin was in, and thin has never really gone out in media terms. So that's what people look for. Um, and as Anna was saying, the whole plastic surgery thing, it's just, it's layer upon layer of a way we can adjust both ourselves and the way we look and the perception of what we would like to look. I just want to come in with an evolutionary point as well. There is actually a, a sort of evolutionary explanation for women suddenly deciding to become incredibly thin mm. because you do, don't get incredibly thin women in, in countries that are poor. Okay, so in countries that are poor, being big yeah. is it's good because of, it's a sign yeah, of wealth. That's right. Whereas, so it's the masculine thing again. Yeah, so basically it's a sign of wealth, whereas in, in Western countries, the idea of being thin, it's all about, again, it's, it's usually wealthy people who are thin. Because it's the choice. Exactly, it's the choice. They can choose to be thin because yeah. they've got enough food that they can say, yeah. actually, I'm not going to eat that yeah. today. And therefore, it's actually a sign, and it's actually a sign of women becoming, in a way, more independent from the, the fact that men need to provide for them. Yeah. It's the fact that women now have their own jobs and can earn their own money. And therefore, that's why they can actually be thin and say, look, I'm actually independently okay. wealthy and I'm thin. So there is some science in it then? There is a bit of science yes. in it. Okay, interesting. Um, coming to something a little bit practical, um, the chemicals that are, you know, dropping. Well, first of all, they're obstacles for us and then they start dropping. Um, what does that tell you? Um, can you give us some facts about this kind of two-month thing, three-month thing, three-year thing, seven-year thing? What's going on inside us? I mean, do these, do these uh, milestones actually exist, or is that a myth? Um, very much on an average scale, yes, they do. I mean, obviously, all people are different. Some people want different things as well. There, it has been proven that some people are addicted to the honeymoon period of falling in love that first four to six months of crazy chemicals going on in your body, some people live for that. And as soon as things start to settle, they want to then move on and go, actually, no, I want the honeymoon period back again. It's something that I think socially, um, that there are some implications in it. Before, people would get to the attachment phase and want to settle down. But I think there is a kind of, there's a different aspect to it in that I, I don't want to generalise, but I certainly know an awful lot of men that get to a certain stage in a relationship where people used to want to settle down and have children and they don't necessarily want to anymore because they feel, and women as well, you know, something's been taken away from them, mm. a certain aspect of freedom has been taken away. 
But the chemicals, pretty much, yeah, you can't help what's going on, I'm afraid. They're not with us, they're against us. So nature is sort of <laughs> chemically telling us we need to do these things. Mm -hmm. So, Tony, what's going on with the guys? If we are driven by procreation, why is it? I, th I think I agree with you, actually. And it's not because we're women of a certain age either. or anything, you know. <laughs> so what's going on? Um, is it to do with modern societies? Why can you date someone for 10 years and they decide, actually, they don't want to have babies and settle down? I'm not bitter or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to speak for all men. Or, uh, You're the only oh, man oh, on oh, stage, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's quite all right. Uh, so, so, so I, again, I, I think there's, a, there's probably an interesting evolutionary spin on the question, mm. which is that evolution doesn't usually kind of code for the outcome. So while men may or may, or may not consciously want children, men find sex pleasurable, and the outcome of sex without contraception is children. So e even though men may not expressly want children, uh, evolution has kind of equipped right. them with, with desires that lead to, lead to procreation. Okay, cool. Um, no, that, that, actually, that actually answers the question. It does, it does really make sense. It's not really a consciousness at all, is it? Yes, most of my boyfriends have never been very conscious. Um, so the other... Um, it, I was watching a programme. I don't know if any of you saw this thing um, on Channel 4 called... Um, is being mixed race better. Did you see that? Um, and what I found interesting about that was, um, I have to read the word because I've forgotten the word, homo and heterozygosity, which is um, needing, uh, needing to mate with somebody who's different enough so that your genes can be healthier. Um, and I'm interested in this question because, of course, we live in such a multicultural city. Um, so why, why do we not see, when people come together from, you know, in a city like this from all over the world, why do we not see people attracting to people who are as different as possible from them? So uh, I, I kind of mentioned similarity as being an, uh, an important, important factor. Yes. Uh, and actually I kind of missed out the other half of it, which you're right to bring up. So uh, people do want something similar, but they don't want something uh, too similar. So you get effects of things like inbreeding. Uh, so Patrick Bateson in the 1980s did work with uh, Japanese quail, uh, and he showed that you know, effectively what you have is something called optimal outbreeding, so something that kind of shares genes in common with you, but not too many genes in common with you. Uh, and perhaps, well, I don't know if that's a full explanation of, you know, so I suspect there's probably strong cultural pressures as well. I was going to say, from an uh, ideological mm. perspective, uh, uh, obviously the thing about humans is we, we are, yes, we are biological animals, but we're also cultural animals. And the fact is that, is that to be able to sort of interbreed and intermix and have mixed marriages, you've got quite a lot of cultural differences to overcome. Um, and, and therefore, I think there's probably a major cultural reason why it doesn't happen as well. Mm. So kind of things like behavioural compatibility are also they, they, mm. they come out really strongly in psychology studies. So you know if you if you don't share a kind of almost like a kind of shared culture, you have less in common. And mm. You were talking about values earlier. Yes, um. and I think you know what Susan's saying about lust um, and when the hormones kick in, that can happen you know multiculturally very easily. What happens is socioeconomically, culturally, traditionally, pressure from families, all those things over the years, you know, it's sort of almost that thing of when you come from a certain, you know, ethnicity, your family wants you to continue that ethnicity down the line in a pure sense. So it's so um, traditional that, th that it's sort of, it's almost impossible to look at it and say, why don't we do it or why do we do it? I think in terms of psychological evolution, we've almost sort of left that behind um, now, so it happens, or it, you um, know, it when you were talking about the shopping list, I mean, mm. why are we so fussy? I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, it doesn't really matter, you know. Why aren't we just going for, you know, just the skirt? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as in the shopping analogy, um, I think it's partly due to. Um, I don't think people know what their expectations should be these days. It's such an enormous pull out, such an enormous world. Um, that what happens is, and also they fear sometimes um, meeting someone or sort of getting hurt. So if you can sort of defend yourself with a very long shopping list and you're not going to meet that person, you sort of subconsciously know it's impossible, therefore you can't get hurt. So I see a lot of clients who sort of come to, you know, to me with a very long list 
sort of half knowing, or by the time they finish with me, they know fully, um, that they're not going to find that person. So they're going to have to pick the non-negotiables, the things that really matter. And alternatively, and it's normally men rather than women, and I don't want to generalise too much, the ones that have that, and just like a male shopper, you know, they go in, they say, I want a pair of trousers in that one shop, I'll go. Uh, you're in and out, women will tend to go around all the shops and sort of check to see what is there before they finally possibly come back to the first skirt they saw. Um, so it's, it's very like that with our sort of choice of partner too. Um, staying on that a little bit, Anna, social status. Why are we so attracted to social status even when it's not accompanied by the ability to provide or good genes? What, what's that about? Why are we obsessed with it? I think because, I mean, there might, there might still be a slight link with, with genetics in terms of social status, because to be perfectly honest, I mean, if we look, for example, in the primate world, and we are primates, so let's not forget that, um, if we look at sort of hierarchies that occur in, in chimpanzee groups, there is often a link between who is at the top of that hierarchy and their genetic strength their genetic health and therefore that probably is you know a hangover from our, our from our primate past but generally to be honest also social status even if i suppose you haven't got uh, the wealth with you there or the ability to provide because you have such a, a good position in society you're much more likely to have access to that than somebody who doesn't have a good position in society to be honest and again we are highly social beings you know and as people say you know it's, it's who you know um, mm. And therefore, social status is, is quite often, you know, we, we did in fact ask a social status question on this big, big study. I'm afraid I, we haven't analysed that bit yet. But, you know, it, we asked whether how important social status is to you. So it would be interesting to see. But I think it probably is linked to the fact that you have a lot of contacts. And therefore, so the potential being able to is provide there. still. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I've got a really difficult question now, and this is for any of you. Why are people gay? What is the evolutionary reason? We're talking about attraction, um, mainly about procreation. What is the advantage of a big percentage of the population being homosexual? I don't know why I'm looking at you. Um, but maybe <laughs> That's all right, it's quite all right. Sure, um, if you'd like, maybe you'd like to start, because it feels a bit more like your area, but I, I want to hear if, if anybody sort of knows. So, so I mean, well, in, 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 in the animal kingdom, people, people have reported kind of homosexual behaviour. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like uh, two, two birds from monogamous species and two males pair up. Uh, and in those instances, it's often just because they, they are unable to mate uh, heterosexually. Uh, biologically speaking, actually, I, you know, there are theories about why homosexuality persists. Uh, but uh, actually, the, the, we don't have a really good scientific answer, I think, to be honest. Uh, I mean, the, the argument from a yes, I mean, from, from sort of... Um, the animals is, is, you know, some sort of helpers at the nest situation. Mm. So when you've got a situation where, where you maybe have, a, for example, a single female and lots, lots of males, and therefore you have... Um, I mean, it tends to happen, for example, in sort of South American New World monkeys. You get sort of helpers at the nest, and they are actually, rather than actually being homosexual, in a way they're actually reproductively suppressed. It's a chemical yes. thing. It's a mm, pheromone mm, thing. Mm. Uh, and because they can't, they have multiple births and they can't bring the, bring the, the infants up, then these males actually help bring those infants up but don't have the position to mate. And so one of the arguments is it's helpers at the nest. But Tony's right. We actually don't know why a homosexual. Do you think that's the best thought. theory at the moment? I don't, because obviously in those animals, we don't then have th the idea of, of actually, you know, still having sexual relations and actually ha building relationships. You know, within humans, homosexual relationships are, are relationships uh, in the same way, a romantic relationship. Mm. So it, it might be an answer some way down the evolutionary line, but why we then evolved to actually have loving homosexual relationships, I, I don't think anybody really knows. Mm. Theories? No, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's very difficult. I mean, definitely there's a sort of hormonal thing going on. The balance of testosterone and estrogen will be probably be different um, in a homosexual man than it is in a heterosexual man, but we're only on an axis. We know we're, we're none of us are 100% heterosexual or 100% homosexual. You know, we're somewhere along the way. And then culturally, um, particularly in our society, it's become more acceptable to express the desire um, of being homosexual, whereas, you know, 100 years ago, again, you know, people had to suppress that. They weren't allowed to, um, to, to give in, if you like, to, to those needs and wants. So I think the percent in percentage terms, it's probably been pretty stable um, f for many, many years, um, many generations. But now, mm. you know, finally we're allowed to um, express this in a sort of cultural way we weren't allowed to before. 
I think um, I've probably got a couple more questions. So if you want to start thinking about what you might want to ask, yeah. Um, I wanted to come back to addiction because I've got I've got this this nagging question that I've been thinking about for a while. Why is it that some people are attracted to criminals, social outcasts? You know, they get married to people in prison that they haven't actually met in the outside world. Why does that happen? I honestly don't know. I've not covered that yet. Um, certainly. There are some addictive chemicals going on when you do fall in love. Um, whether, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, I shouldn't say falling in love with a criminal is like online dating, but <laughs> there, is, there is this aspect of falling in love with somebody you haven't necessarily met, and so you are missing out on an awful lot of steps, I would say, chemically. Um, whether it is that people, I don't know, like a nice stable partner, know where they are every time. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't want to, I can't scientifically comment on that. But, um, but I do find it fascinating. There must be some kind of chemical difference going on there. So do you think with online dating, um, people do fall in love, especially um, if they have a long-distance relationship, they're in different countries, and then when they meet up, they meet up to get married. I've, I've read about these stories um, so what's going on there? I mean, we'd, you, you mentioned smell. Um, so w how can people... People do fall in love without meeting. How is that possible? I presume this is the, the social part of it then taking over. People, again, I don't want to generalise, get to a certain age perhaps, and say, well, do uh -oh. you know what? I would like to settle down, and this is what I'd like, and this person shares common values with me. Their ultimate goal is to settle down, to become a family unit, perhaps to have children. I presume certain aspects of falling in love, the feelings of initially falling in love and lust and attraction, are compromised, perhaps, because they do want the end goal. I think you actually almost skip the last stage, in fact. The I last mean, stage. The last, oh, the, the first last. stage, the <laughs> last. Um, because you were talking about the smell. I mean, after sight in terms of sexual attraction smell is the next most important thing and we're not always aware of it but it's incredibly um fundamental in the way that we think about somebody so i think what people do when they're sort of internet dating and they fall in love is literally you know the whole chemical thing is it's literally skipped so you get to know somebody um, again it's still quite one-dimensional but no more one-dimensional than seeing them or smelling them to be quite honest and not knowing them and saying love at first sight i mean that's equally as unlikely um or as likely as mm. as falling in love with somebody who you haven't actually seen mm. um one of the reasons i started this um socializing group for singles is because i thought to myself you know traditionally how have people always met and like you know we, we've kind of said they've met through sort of um, their social circles through actually meeting people. And once you've met people a few times, the whole kind of familiarity thing again, then you start, you know, finding things attractive that you might not... Because the only option for a lot of single people, especially after a certain age um, today, um, is, is just the meeting. Why do you think online dating has become what I'm starting to call disposable dates? What's going on then? Is that to do with the fact that we haven't... Um, we haven't had the time to develop all the things and, and the, the chemical outputs and everything that you need to actually really, truly be attracted to someone. I think it's huge now. It's absolutely massive, phenomenal. I think one of the things is that, you know, I develop psychometric tests for um, these internet dating companies. What everyone is trying to do is fall over themselves to do compatibility tests that are better than the next person so they can say who is likely to meet. In an absolute truth, nine out of ten people still dot down the postage stamp size of the pictures and sort of think... No, 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 mm. yes. I mean, height, that's... Don't forget height. Uh, but you can't see height from a sort of... from a, a lies. They're all two inches taller, <laughs> aren't they, online? <laughs> and also five years older. Um, but, the, but the point is, we're looking. It's still that physical dimension. However sophisticated I can make a compatibility test, it's still never going to replace. But you were talking about that sense of immediacy with someone who is a yes or no. So it's, you know, you say becoming more disposable. It's becoming bigger... Um, and, but it's becoming more niche as well. So I think if you're really serious about finding a date, sometimes you want to go to the more niche sites that suit you, your age, your type, rather than one of those enormous impersonal, mm -hmm. you know, global sites with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on them. I just want to point another thing out as well. And another thing that makes humans different is the fact that we have language and speech and writing. And, and therefore, I mean, there's a, there's a guy called Jeffrey Miller in the States who very strongly believes that one of the ways we advertise our fitness and our attractiveness is actually our brains. Our brains are attractive. And that's one of the things I suppose you have with online dating is yeah. when you're writing your profile, 
that is your, in a way, your, your intelligence, your brain on a page. And therefore, humans do so. advertise their brains as well. And that's partly probably, you know, the, the group that you set up. in America, you know. for example, you know, they, they will write their profiles. You know, I'm fantastic, I'm brilliant, I'm skilled, <laughs> I'm marvellous at what I do, you know, I'm fabulous, come by me. Whereas British people are much more self deprecating, mm. so it's like, oh gosh, you got to my page, thanks for looking. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so sorry true. to keep you, but, you know, so that's a whole sort of, you know, it's a cultural thing. I have to get people out of this, because people don't want to boast, they don't want to seem arrogant, but if you don't sell yourself, yeah. it's like a house, you know, it, on the internet, you've got to sell yourself. people, like, people always say, why do rock stars have so, I mean, you know, so many children, and why do Picasso have so many children? And it's partly because creativity and advertising your brain is an attractive thing. And that's why poets, you know, people line up and want to go out with poets. Mm, poor, good news, good poor news but for a good geeks. brain. <laughs> yes. mm, very good news for the geeks. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, we've, got a, we've got someone with a mic. Cool. Um, in the middle there and then at the front. We've got two mics, right? Yeah, at the front here. Oh. Do you want to put your hand up again? So. There was um, like a noted discrepancy between what women think men are attractive and what men think are attractive, and then the same for men, so what they think women will find attractive. Just going back to that point about women trying to be skinny, 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 do men actually find that attractive? No, they don't. They like this. <laughs> great for me, great for me. I know it. I'm like the Americans on online dating. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, who'd like to take that? So, 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 I, I agree with you. You are right. Oh, so, so they, they, <laughs> they, 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 there is re research uh, exactly looking at that, kind of showing, showing men pictures of women's kind of uh, body shapes, uh, looking at kind of the amount of fat present. And men like fatter women than women think men like. Mm. But, but likewise, it does work in reverse also. So men think that women like uh, really bulgy muscles. Uh, and women tend not to like as bulgy muscles as men think that women like. Uh, so so there, there, there does seem to be some discrepancy in what men, men and women think each other likes and in, in some ways are kind of putting themselves through, you know, the diets and the working out in the gym, you know, probably, probably not quite, you know, they probably shouldn't be, be doing it. It's not really what the opposite sex do want. So for, for both sexes, just let yourselves go. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's your chocolate, so really, isn't it? Just keep eating the chocolate. But really, it's what you were saying about communication. So long as, you know, you talk to each other about it, you know, you can both get to a point where you like each other's bodies. You know, just talk about it. Um, at the front here. Uh, thanks. Um, there seems to be some, some evidence that uh, the oral contraceptive pill changes women's preferences, shifts them towards the um, less masculine uh, preference. Is this something any of the panellists have found in, in their research? Um, well, I've, uh, yes, I've talked about this sort of thing in the past. Is sort of this, um, it's, it kind of suppresses certain hormones, um, gives you the kind of flood of estrogen. It's supposed to suppress libido. We're talking about libido, really. And indeed, your body has to adjust to it. I think the thing with any hormonal pill um, or tablet is that it's going to, there is a period of adjustment where a libido drops. Um, and then it's a case of sort of, you know, getting back on track. I think a lot, a lot of women with libidos, they got out of the habit of doing it, and, you know, and, and so they're kind of sex life centre. We just get into bad habits rather than good habits. So I, I, it's definitely research into it, how significant it is. I'm not entirely convinced. Mm. Anna? Uh, it's not a piece of research I've done directly. It's not because I don't tend to deal with sort of, um, sort of the sex hormone and things. But, um, but, but obviously there has been some research looking at, really actually just how, how a woman's cycle affects what she finds attractive anyway, particularly women, in fact, who are having affairs. So and in terms of how much, how, when she will decide to have intercourse with her husband and when she will decide to have intercourse with the person she's having the affair with, particularly if the person she's having the affair with is genetically very symmetrical and very strong, she will actually uh, subconsciously have more intercourse with him when she's fertile so that she gets his genes than, than she would with her partner. But obviously the partner's there to, to provide. So the, so the female cycle does have a lot of effect on what, some will, what a woman will find attractive and when she'll find it attractive. Because obviously, in a way, she'd quite like to combine good genes and providing for her child, if possible. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is the actual statistic for men who are bringing up other men's children who ten, don't know? It's about 10%. <gasps> it's quite high. <laughs> That is really high. <laughs> um, 
Uh, some of them know, some of them unknowingly know, yeah. Yeah, some I mean, I was know. thinking of this because, of course, because of adoption, you know, it doesn't seem to be that big a deal, you know, for people who want to be parents, no. it doesn't matter, but evolutionary, of course. But obviously evolutionarily and also in animals, it's a big thing. So what happens quite a lot in animals is you get mate guarding. Because basically, for example, if you look at a male baboon, when a female baboon is, is fertile, he's stuck to her side because he is going to be the one who is the father of that child. He doesn't want to be, you know, cuckolded in any way, basically. Mm. Um, any more questions in the front here? Um, and then at the back, where's the other one? Um, sorry, can we come back to you and, and one over here? Yeah, sorry, go for it. Um, well, I've, I've found a lot of what's been said has made an awful lot of sense to me. Perhaps it's the romantic in me. I find myself kind of kicking against some of it. Perhaps I want to believe in something more than just chemicals. But uh, I'd like to sort of put in a plea for the psychological factors because in terms of things like falling in love, why we stay together and what happens when we break up, I can understand the, the kind of um, the endorphin hypothesis. But when you break up, when I break up, for example, um, you, you feel certain things like you feel loneliness, you feel a sort of... Uh, maybe a lack of self-worth, which seems to point to reasons why you're together, for companionship and validation. Mm -hmm. And I guess neither uh, sort of those excludes the other. But I'm wondering how, how you can kind of tease out psychological factors from the sort of chemicals. Or are, are we effectively saying that those are just kind of rationalizations of a kind of, you know, uh, going cold turkey mm. on, the, on the endorphins? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the thing is, the trouble with sort of being, being, being a scientist is sometimes it sounds like it's just yes, biological determinism, and, it, and it's not. I think the thing to remember about humans is we have a big neocortex which allows us to consciously think, you know, we are cognitive beings, as it were. So, obviously, we are driven by the chemicals, and they, they, they do play a major part, and they explain, for example, why somebody would stay in an abusive relationship, possibly because okay, they can be that powerful. But, yes, on top of that, you have a cognitive brain. You have a brain that's whirring away there, and therefore we, it, it's not a direct line relationship. Obviously, it will be tempered by the fact that you are a conscious being and you can, you can, you can alter your behaviour. Psychologists want to say something on this? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think uh, actually a lot, lots of these things are kind of unconsciously underpinned by hormones. Uh, there's a really nice example of uh, testosterone being linked to kind of, you know, if, you're, if, you're, team, if, you're, if you're a football supporter uh, and your team loses, you know, your testosterone drops down, but associated with that testosterone dip you know, it are all of those feelings of kind of loss and defeat and, and so forth. I, yeah, I, I suspect it'll actually be very, very difficult to pull apart kind of what's, what's cognitive and and what's biological, because the two are you know, probably I mean, going, always going to come together. What's interesting is when we put somebody in an MRI scanner and we um, do... Sounds horrible, but we give them some physical pain. Um, it's very, you know... And um, <laughs> obviously, an area, the area of the light, pain area of the brain lights up. But then if we induce in them um, social rejection, the same area lights up. OK, so physical pain and the pain you feel when you've been rejected by somebody, even though it's a very much a, a mental thing... It's actually the same area of your brain doing it. So it's in a way, it seems like we've managed to sort of adapt our brains to have sort of this, 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 yes, this social mental rejection and pain, but also a physical pain as well. So it might never be possible to, to separate the two. No, I don't think you will. Suze, could you reassure our romantic in the front row that it's not just chemistry? I really can't. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Basically, uh, so a song was alerted to me recently by someone that's not called Key Dollar Ha. Apparently, it's Kesha. Anyway, <laughs> she, uh, she has a song called Your Love Is My Drug, and unfortunately falling in love is a bit of a, a druggy roller coaster. and when you break up with somebody, it is very similar to drug withdrawal. You feel very, very similar symptoms. Sorry. The Robert Palmer hypothesis. Well, if we must. <laughs> as, as, as a positive comment, I think, just because these things are kind of, you know, actually all of your thoughts are just neurons firing in your brain, the, 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 fact, the fact that these things are, are kind of chemistry doesn't really make them any less important so nothing is real just killed love <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, positive questions um at the front here yeah hi guys um i just wanted to um bring it back to the uh, original point that was touched on at the beginning um the historical perspective um and uh, the question of uh, or the statement uh, that's made in the original argument that the importance of being attractive to the opposite sex has increased dramatically in recent times for both men and women. Uh, I'd like to ask the panellists, is this really the case? And if so, why? 
we were all given that description. <laughs> we didn't write that description. We were all upstairs. We're having a bit of a rant about mm. it. No, it hasn't. Obviously, I think it's become mm. more competitive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't think. I think that's it. I'm not quite sure mm. what that statement means. All the I way think. I mean, it's something to do with fragmented societies. Um, it's why online dating has become so popular, why people like me are starting these singles groups. Um, but I think something else within that is romantic love. I mean, it, that's, romantic love is quite a modern notion, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I totally agree with that as being a mo What do you mean by modern in the last, you know, thousand years? How, what do you mean by modern? Yeah, yeah, relatively okay, modern. Okay, yeah. well, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> in that sense. But, I mean, the interesting thing about romance is, uh, just going back to you in a way, it's, it's incredibly, um, it's intimate and it's very personal. And that's why romance doesn't work uh, in internet dating, because the minute you start to put down a poem to someone you've never met, you're, you're crossing all sorts of boundaries. People either go, ooh, you know, cheesy, terrible. Um, it just doesn't work. It's, it's a kind of, you know, a, a stepped intimacy before you can actually, you know, become romantic. I don't think you can become romantic, um, you know, disassociated, unattached to somebody. It just doesn't really... What? Did we answer your question? Yes. She's, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we, we do. <laughs> Some sociologists, uh, such as Anthony Giddens, do, do have, have argued or posited that uh, love is a very modern, ter modern concept. And you know, prior to sort of like the uh, 16, 1500s, the concept of love didn't really exist in society. So maybe that's. I, think, mm. I, I don't think I'd say that. I think love, that the feelings that come with love have always existed. Whether or not you actually loved the person you married is another matter. <laughs> you know, marriages, yeah, he's right. Marriages were social contracts. They were about money and power. They weren't about love. But it doesn't mean that those two people weren't off loving somebody else. Mm. Um, um, right at the back over there, um, near the camera operator, have you already got a mic? Yes. Go for it. Um, I basically read somewhere that the hormone oxytocin peaks in men af after seven years, so they fall out of love. How much truth is there in, in that? Saying that it was on Facebook, so I'm not. <laughs> With someone's status. Um, oxytocin, by, by the time you are well within the oxytocin stages of love, not to weird people out, but obviously there are differences between that romantic, passionate, sexual love that you initially feel for somebody and the love that you have for people you deeply care about, your, your family. But ultimately, the oxytocin stage, as I was saying, it, it's secreted in mother's milk. It's passed down to babies. It creates a, a longer-lasting bond, and it is a different kind of love. If people are, you know, oxytocin levels are dropping after a certain point, hopefully there are other ties. You know, it's a loyalty thing. Oxytocin is promoting loyalty and stuff. So if, if Facebook is right, um, and if that is indeed the case, hopefully by seven years into the oxytocin phase, so we're looking at, what, I don't know, eight, nine years or so into a relationship, hopefully... We're all right. Hopefully we're not all falling out of love after the seven-year itch. I don't know. I mean, our, our research at Oxford is... Um, because, obviously, there's a range of chemicals that... And, and, and obviously, you, you mentioned quite a lot of them. You know, it, relationship attachment isn't down to one chemical. It's down to lots of chemicals that interact. And I think the thing about oxytocin is oxytocin is... It, it is an important chemical, but it's much more important at the beginning of a relationship. It's kind of the chemical that, yeah, as you said, makes you go, oh, wow, you know, about somebody. And it's that initial attachment. But oxytocin... Um, isn't actually that long-lived. It degrades very, very quickly. And also, humans become tolerant to it. So if you constantly have floods of oxytocin, it has no effect on you. And that's why mm. we actually argue that basically oxytocin is what's there at the beginning. But as that dips down, possibly at seven years, I don't know, it's not really my area, other things take over. And that's what we argue is that, is that basically it's your endorphin system and possibly dopamine that come in. And they're actually what give you the long-term attachment to your partner or your child or whatever it might be. So oxytocin is your sort of kick-off chemical, but the one that keeps you together is probably an endorphin. Well, the oxytocin mm. and the other chemicals, as I mentioned, dopamine, serotonin, they almost kind of, to get a bit geeky, they're kind of like sine exactly, waves, slightly out do. of phase. They and do. so when oxytocin levels do drop, yeah. when they rise, they're basically inhibiting the effect of a lot of other yeah. chemicals, like the dopamines and the serotonin. So... I presume they maybe do just rise and yeah, fall ox and complement one another. Oxytocin inhibits endorphins, yeah. for example. So you can't actually have both together. So. Oh. Um, there was one question over there ages ago. I don't know if you've changed your mind. 
So no question over there, no. Okay, then we've got, um, oh my goodness. Um, I think that the lady in front of the lady who just asked that question over there, and um, could we bring one more over here? Because these guys have been waiting. So we've got one, two, three, um, fr um, front, and then I'll come to you, sir. Um, hi, uh, you said that the four C's, so how do you stimulate communication in relationships when usually misunderstandings, expectations, always going to break down the communications during any stage of the relationship? Um, yeah, well, sustaining <coughs> communication. I mean, what happens is when I see couples, I mean, it'd be much better if I would see um, couples to counsel them when they sensed there was something not quite right with their relationship rather than when something had actually gone wrong, which is invariably when they come to see me. Um, if communica communication starts to break down quite quickly in a lot of relationships, or at least the, the quality of communication, it becomes practical. You know, it becomes sort of day-to-day -day and mundane, and, and people get out the habit long time before they realise there's a problem in their relationship. So my mission, if you like, it sounds a bit pompous, I don't mean it to sound like that, but it's to make sure that people are talking to each other at every stage appropriately about everything that they feel. I mean, to get that sense of um, when and how and if. I mean, if you think your partner is dreadful in bed for whatever reason, um, don't tell them in the bedroom. Um, it, it's, it's sort of that sense of communication and the quality of communication and the maintenance and the sustenance that I try and get over to people because sometimes when people come to me, it's almost a case of locking the stable door after the horse has bolted. I mean, all meaningful communication has gone and then it's really quite hard to, to bring it back to the table. Mm. I hope you've got lots of business cards with you. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, it's um, great. At the front. Obviously, in, I'm talking about our Western society, we are very quick to take uh, medication for our various ills, and uh, obviously you've talked about antidepressants, SSRIs, um, you know, you have all the benzodiazepines in terms of controlling um, anxiety responses. Um, I'm just interested a little bit more in what pharmaceutical companies are doing about this, because surely there must be a, a huge market for kind of creating pills that people can take, you know, when, when that endorphin level drops off, oh, you know, pop a pill, bring it back up. Obviously, you talked about oxytocin runs out after, after a point, but um, is there any, anything out on the market for that? Or <laughs> <laughs> and if so, where can I go and get it? <laughs> um, but no, I mean, what, what are pharmaceutical companies doing? They, they, surely they must be doing something. I think the they? problem you have with a lot of these chemicals is, is they're actually quite difficult to get into your brain. Oxytocin is really easy, actually. There's been a lot of studies. I think the reason why you can't use it is probably not being licensed for general use, but you can get oxytocin to spray up your nose. And it's been used in lots of dating studies where basically they've had sort of controls of people who haven't got oxytocin squirted up their nose and other people who've got oxytocin And they find everyone much more attractive. They also actually become, they did a separate study on it, um, not in a dating scenario, but in a kind of if you had to save different groups of people scenario. So there's people from within your loyalty group and people from outside your loyalty group and the people that had had the oxytocin sprayed up them. And there's no real connection with, within this inner group, but people with the oxytocin yeah, went for their, yeah. their own loyalty and they really stuck with their own group compared to the ones that didn't have it. So I think the problem with a lot of these drugs is that because of the way that we interact with people now, the social side of things, you can't always say what the responses are going to be. So yes, you may fall in love more easily or you may get somebody to fall in love with you more easily, but they may fall in love with everybody more easily. And <laughs> there's, you but know, also you really things that inhibit that. I mean, you know, alcohol, which is generally considered to be something which um, allows us to lose our inhibitions, also gives us, you know, the traditional beer goggles, you know, for where everybody looks suddenly lovely, you know, after a few <laughs> drinks. So, you know, once you try artificially to put any chemical into a body, it's got its, you know, its pluses and minuses. It, unfortunately, it's not as simple as saying, right, you know, we have a mouthful of endorphins, there's going to be a, you know, the sort of yin and yang, there's going to be a downside to taking that. And the only things we can give you that would mimic endorphins are highly addictive. So, like morphine. We could give you morphine and it would have the same effect, but you, yeah. <laughs> not <laughs> not a good idea. Was that a question about love patients? I think it no, kind no, of... No, 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 it was a gen genuine interest because, you know, economics drive most things. Mm. So, you know, 
I don't sure. ethically think they'd get it through. I think but that's if why. If anyone wants to fund my postdoc, <laughs> 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 um, the blue shirt. I was very curious on one thing. Um, one can fall in love with the most inappropriate people mm -hmm. and they could be even detrimental to your health mm -hmm. and to your family. And I'm wondering why that is the case. Why is it that in evolutionary terms one should be falling in love with people who will support you and um, hopefully bring up a family and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but in many cases y y people fall in love to the in most inappropriate mm -hmm. people, and I'm just wondering why that's the case. Again, it's 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 probably chemistry, and you know, unfortunately, we don't all behave optimally in terms of, of, of what we, in terms of evolution, and it probably is to do with chemistry. Unfortunately, people have dysfunctions of their neurons, and they have, for example, dysfunction of the endorphin system, which leads them to yes, behave inappropriately in, re in relationships, or and again, you know, we haven't studied it, but something we really do want to look at is the link between the chemistry in your brain and, and abusive relationships. So why do people stay in abusive relationships which are incredibly bad for them, but they keep on going back? And is that something to do with their neurochemistry? We don't really know yet. But, but yes, it's, it's probably to do with your chemistry. I think, that, yeah, I think there must be just a massive fundamental difference in the chemicals that a lot of these people are producing. Yeah. I mean, you get some real extremes. There was a programme which I thankfully didn't watch about the lady that married the Eiffel Tower or something. Mm. And aside from, well, obvious, you know, the symbolic, perhaps, nature of the Eiffel Tower, I'm being so careful tonight, um, I, you know, that, that makes no sense. It's an inanimate object. She apparently referred to the Eiffel Tower as a woman throughout this programme. But, you know, obviously there is something going on there. Well, that's objectification. I would argue deeper than chemistry. But Can I just... That's it safe. It's objectification where people fall in love with buildings. And I talked about this on the TV about women who fell in love with um, the Statue of Liberty. And um, that was her husband. She married the Statue of Liberty. And it's objectification. It is actually safer. It's nothing to do with what has something to do with chemicals. But psychologically, it's to do with the fact she is safe with the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is never oh. going to hurt her. The Statue of Liberty is never going to let her down. Um, all those things. She felt very safe with the Statue of Liberty. And so you're confirming it's not chemistry? Um, there you go. Well, also, it, it was non-threatening sexually to her. Mm. I mean, I know that sounds obvious because it's a building. Um, <laughs> but that was what that was one of the key things. There was no threat to this to this woman to, to have fallen in love with deeply in love with, with a building. I mean a lot of a lot of the chemicals that underpin relationships are also involved in 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 mental health, for example. So a lot of a lot of the disorders that, that are suffered from, a lot of the chemicals are the same. Um, so, you know. Okay. Then we've got three more here. Um, Oh, sorry, here. And at the back, okay, four, right? Um, I think it's probably what we're going to have time for, so go for it. Hi. Um, is there any evolutionary reason to remain monogamous uh, after your children have grown up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a, oh, that's a political one. Um, technically, <laughs> no. But actually, it's a myth that humans are monogamous anyway because they're not. If you look at the it, it, it rates of in, infidelity, and obviously in a lot of non-Western cultures, people aren't monogamous. So it's very much a Western thing. Um, and again, it's probably imposed more culturally than anything else. But if we, if we look biologically at humans, they're not monogamous. And a lot of the traits we look at in primates to tell whether they're monogamous or not, and it's all to do with genitals, so I won't go into it here, um, but <laughs> indicate that, that humans aren't monogamous. But yes, if we look at it, no, there isn't a reason. In a way, once your children have, have, have flown the nest, in a way, you should, you should go off and, uh, or breed again with, with your partner, or as a male, yes, go and find a younger model and start breeding again, I suppose. Don't tell him that. Um, Biologically, but it's we, not a good idea. Are we not, ser are we not serial monogamous? I yes, thought, yes, we are. But, in, but that's a very Western viewpoint. I mean, we are, in Western societies, we are serial monogamists, but obviously there are a lot of non-Western societies where that's not the case. And what, what about polyamory? That's become very fashionable recently. <laughs> a lot of people would say that we are actually polyamorous. Well, what, basically, what, what, we, what we... If we look at um, the evidence, actually what we should be is we should be slightly like the chimp model, which is, which is yes, males mating with a lot of, lot of females, so multi-male, multi-female groups living together. We're not quite as extreme as chimps, but we're probably mm. on that continuum. So blame society. Um, yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think 
was <coughs> actually it was exactly the same question or similar. <laughs> I mean, what's the interpretation in evolutional psychology for polygam polygamy? I don't know. For polygamy? Yeah, polygamy. What yeah. one man having lots of lots of women? Yeah. Yeah, basically because he can. Because the thing is, he's not restricted by his by his reproductive yeah. biology, so he but can. On evolutionally, evolutional psychology. I mean, is it helpful? Is it not helpful? Is it damaging? I don't think it's particularly damaging. I mean, he is in a way following his biology, and so the women, the women aren't in a position where they. That's why polyandry, which is one woman and lots of men, is incredibly rare. rare. Because but it's advantageous in that environment. In that environment. So in Nepal, you get polyandry because what they're trying to do is actually keep the farms together rather than splitting them between all the sons. So you get one woman who will marry lots of men, but it's very, very rare because biologically it doesn't work out, obviously, because those men are not optimising their breeding potential because they've only got one woman to breed with. So that's why poly basically a one man and many women is much more normal. And it's not negative or positive, it's just Whatever suits. following. Yeah. I like polyandry. <laughs> <laughs> At the back over there. Uh, hi, I'd like to ask a question about uh, couples that break up and then come back together. So, why does it happen? And do they start from like the phase they ended their relationship uh, like, before, or do they start over from the like last? And yeah. I think it's one for Joe. What's well, going on there? The, what, the rebound relationship. So where you've kind of all oh, couples that come back, they've broken up. You mean, and they come back together. Um, yes, and it frequently happens. I mean, one is it's that form of the attachment. When you've got that attachment and you break up, that's a very hard thing, both chemically and emotionally, to deal with. So you want to go back to what you know, the comfort zone, even though you've broken up. Now, that is perfectly possible um, to come back, providing we go back to that communication again, and you work out what it is that broke you up in the first place. Um, and then you must have moved on, both of you, from that place, and you can't let that hold you back, because otherwise you're just going to break up again. So, but of course, you know, if you've been in a long-term relationship and you break up over something, a row or a difference of opinion, um, or you just want different things at different times, then coming back together, uh, providing the fundamentals are there and the problems have been dealt with, actually sometimes works better than it does the first time round. And Suze, when you've been through the sequence and you've been apart for a couple of years, what happens? This is the second part of the question. Where do you start? Do you start at the beginning of the sequence again? I don't know, to be honest. I think it very much depends on perhaps why you broke up in the first place and how traumatic that was for you. I am curious to find out whether, if there's been a significant time period between breaking up and getting back together and things have been resolved, do you then go through the roller coaster again? Or do you not? I mean, there was an article that I read earlier today um, about the, the luxury these days that we have of breaking up with people for no particular reason, but because there's no spark. Well, that's just <laughs> chemistry. You've moved on to the next phase of chemicals that your body's producing, but it does seem to happen these days. I don't know. Like I said earlier, some people need and want the honeymoon mm -hmm. period of falling in love it's over and over again, yeah. and so you do get people that do go out with somebody for a little while, the spark goes, they break up, they find someone new, and they yeah. go through that emotional And I think people do that without knowing they're doing it, yeah. because it's that, that buzz that they're seeking. Well, it yeah. is very much like a drug, like Anna said, all these things are. You know, they're there to make us feel better, but they make us feel absolutely rotten as well. They're mm. very much like drugs. Okay, last question, over here. I was wondering about asexuality. So, like, why do humans um, express no sexual interest for other people? Why is there, like, asexuality? And just wants to know about it. Tony, would you like to have a go? Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, 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 uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, perhaps... <laughs> I, I can, yeah, I, I've seen kind of studies on things like uh, trying to explain things like celibacy, so why people choo choose not, not to have sex, but actually n not being attracted to, to anything or anyone. Uh, I, 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 I kind of rather suspect it's, uh, it's, it's very unusual. Uh, so I, 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 I can't really think of a, of a good explanation for it uh, other than kind of you know, perhaps more, more, more chemical explanations whereby you, you're, you're, you're people are missing the... The, the required kind of uh, mechanisms for those uh, 
uh, you know, mm. that falling in love or the, that, that kind of sexual attraction. I think asexual people say that they do fall in love. I mean, the people I've dealt with are asexual definitely fall in love. They just don't want, they don't want sexuality. They don't want sexual connection. Um, mm. But they still go through what they consider to be love. Um, and, and often it's to do with, it's the childhood trauma that stops that, the sexual trigger of desire, but doesn't stop the emotions of love, if that makes sense. Wow. I wish we could carry on, but we're out of time. Um, I'm really sorry, we're out of time. Um, before we finish, I'd just like to ask you very, very quickly, each of you, where in this day and age, in this city, or this kind of city, where do you meet people? <laughs> well, personally... Uh, <laughs> Um, I think the most important thing, this is completely not going from neurochemistry, but you, you will meet people who you like if you go somewhere where you're doing similar things. So, yeah, I think the way Obvious. to go, actually, is, is sort of the groups where it's actually an interest you're going to and actually you're more likely to meet somebody mm. if you share an interest. Tony, where should we meet people? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. oh, so, <laughs> you, 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 you know, if, you, if you go somewhere because you want to go there and there are other people there who, who are also interested in that mm. thing, then you have something to talk about straight away. Is anyone going to say online dating? What do you think, Jay? Where do we meet people? Oh, I think it's keeping all your options open. So I think it's anywhere, um, anytime. You know, people internet date and they're behind their front doors. They don't go out. I mean, that is not dating. That is not making a relationship, really. So I think just keep every option open and, you know, keep proactive, be opportunistic, be optimistic. You know, just you're maximising your mating chances, basically. Mm. I don't know why I'm asking you. So. I don't know, but I'm taking all this <laughs> advice on board. <laughs> what, what do you think? No, genuinely, I'm taking all the advice yeah. on board. Yeah. <laughs> I, Hobbies. I presume, yeah, I guess mm. if you have one thing in common, you don't have to be exactly the yeah. same person, but you have enough familiarity without being a carbon copy of somebody. So, good so place to start. So, not too many ticks for online dating, I'm afraid. So, go out there and follow your interests. Thank you very much for coming out on a Saturday night. And please do look at the rest of the events in the Royal Society's summer programme. Thank you very much. And please, big, big round of applause for our speakers.